everybody. Welcome to Psychedelics Weekly, your weekly roundup on all things psychedelic. It's really great to have you all with us. I am Julian Bost, your host for today's episode. This week's episode is quite special as we will, we will be joined by one of the biggest names in psychedelic neuroscience, Manesh Gurn. Manesh is the Chief Research Officer for Entheotech Bioscience and a neuroscience PhD candidate at McGill University, where he works out of the Montreal Neurological Institute. His research predominantly focuses on the default mode network and on the brain mechanisms underlying psychedelic drugs as revealed by FMRI. He has been the lead or co-author on over a dozen peer-reviewed scientific publications. He is currently co-authoring a paper with Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris, and he will be joining Dr. Carhart-Harris at the University of California, San Francisco, as a postdoc in August 2023. Some of you may have come across his YouTube page, The Psychedelic Scientist, where Manesh disseminates the latest developments in scientific research involving psychedelic drugs for a more general audience. I'm really excited for our chat today. Um, my background is chronic pain and psychedelics, mainly through the lens of cognitive and depth psychology. So I'm eager to hear and learn from a neuroscience expert, if you will, and yeah, hear his thoughts on a few papers we will be discussing today. Now, if any of you listened to the Psychedelics Weekly episode on either December 30th or January 6th, you might remember hearing about a couple of these pa papers briefly mentioned by Joe, Kyle, or David. You can find those episodes on our YouTube page if you are interested. Welcome, Anesh. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you, and thanks for the intro. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So the first paper we will be going into today is titled... The psychotomimetic ketamine disrupts the transfer of late sensory information in the corticothalamic network by Yi Kin and Ali Madavi. I hope I'm saying those names right, and I apologize if not. Yes, yeah, so Manesh, what, uh, do you want to just give us a high-level summary uh, before we get into the details? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this paper, broadly speaking, was, well, it was done in rodents, in mice, and they were trying to find whether um, aspects of brain function that have been found in models of schizophrenia are found after uh, administering ketamine to these rodents. And um, for a lot of people that might, people don't like, I mean, I personally, a lot of times don't like this whole psychotomimetic perspective on psychedelics, especially serotonergic psychedelics. But with ketamine, it's quite interesting because um, actually the discovery of ketamine's effects was a big motivator for new perspectives on how schizophrenia might work in the brain. Because um, back in the day, it was really focused on dopamine. And um, with ketamine, which uh, works through the glutamate system, it, these gl uh, the glutamate hypothesis of schizophrenia was um, proposed, and a lot of uh, things have developed from that. So that's the background here. Mechanistically, there seems to be an overlap, even though phenomenologically, there's obvious differences. Um, so in this paper in particular, they're looking at um, differences in sensory processing, so processing sensory stimuli. In this case, it was actually they're vibrating the whiskers of the mice and seeing the sensory signals. That's a very it's it's done very often because they're very sensitive to this, and the way it's processed is um, well characterized. And um, so, when we receive information from our senses, it goes um, through our thalamus, which is this deeper structure, older structure in our brain, which is like a gateway or relay for sensory signals. And it filters them and then sends it to your cortex for more processing. Um, and so in this um, paper, they were looking at uh, thalamocortical connections. So connections that go from the thalamus to the cortex and in relation to sensory stimuli and seeing how it's disrupted. And so the uh, distinction they make is between early and um, late sensory processing. So you think you can imagine it's, it's most intuitive with vision. Let's use that as an example. Um, you know, light hits your eyes and you get these basic uh, kind of impact of photons hitting your retina. And then that needs to be processed and turned into objects, into scenes. Um, and there's like this whole hierarchy of processing going on. And in the early stage, you could say you're just processing very low level features like lines, shadows, etc. And then a later stage is your actual unified perception of what you're seeing. And so here they were specifically seeing how ketamine might disrupt late sensory processing associated with binding together different elements of a stimulus into an integrated perception. And um, in order to do that, they put some electrodes into these rodent brains. 
in um, parts of the thalamus and then parts of the cortex that the, the that thalamic region projects to related to our sense of touch related in this case to touching their whiskers and they're measuring um, brain waves in a particular frequency into two frequencies which is um, beta and gamma which is two of the faster frequencies and the reason why they're looking at those frequencies is because they've been associated with um, binding together different aspects of a stimulus as I just mentioned you know binding is kind of like rapid um, coordination across neurons to bind together different characteristics of what they're perceiving. And so they're like, okay, so how are these being disrupted after ketamine uh, in, re in response to a stimulus? And um, what they hypothesized was that uh, at baseline, there's going to be um, kind of greater ongoing, you could say, activity in those frequency bands. And that when they receive a stimulus, they're going to have less of that stimulus is stimulus is going to have less of an impact on the ongoing um, activity or oscillations. And that's associated with just like not processing it properly, basically. And, um, and so, yeah, so they looked at uh, responses uh, in the brain in these frequencies um, for, after ketamine and without ketamine. And they found how, um, as they predicted, um, before the stimulus, there was more um, what we would call oscillatory power, which just means there's more neurons firing in synchrony together. Uh, there's more of that in the gamma range before they received the stimulus. And then when they got the stimulus in the late stage of the processing, there was much less of an increase or change in those oscillations. And so how they interpret it is that there's this noise initially in the signal um, where these neurons are hyper connected with each other in a way that uh, impairs their ability to process a stimulus when it's received. And so um, there's basically, they're saying there's, you know, disruptions in these frequency bands related to tying together the stimulus into a unified perception. Um, and there's more, but I'll stop there. I'll let you ask me a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it in some ways, it, a simple way to understand it would be like, because the last, the, the late sensory information, that, that's kind of the last stage of processing, right? And that's where your brain is essentially making predictive models about the world. So it's when, you know, when it gets to that stage, which, I mean, and that's a very important stage because our brain is constantly making predictions. That's where the information becomes disrupted and, and it makes things a lot more difficult as far as just understanding your world and moving about it and stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's at the stage of, yeah, one way of thinking about it is through that framework of like, when you're when you're when the bottom up inputs are meeting your predictions, you know, and they're trying to see how they match, that seems to be more of the level being disrupted, like you're receiving the signals. But just when they get to that point of you're trying to create, you're trying to match it to your high level predictions, something's like messed up there is kind of the idea here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can you touch on the it it seems like there was a, a lot more variability in the early part of the processing. And then toward, you know, towards the late stage, it actually becomes less variable, right? It was kind of almost stuck in a way. Is that, can you touch on that or explain that better than I just did? Yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, usually what you'd expect is that there's a particular amount of ongoing oscillations, usually lower and then when the stimulus comes there's higher oscillations in that power which just again corresponds to more neurons firing in synchrony in that freak at that frequency and so after ketamine that change in frequency after the stimulus was reduced so like you're not getting what you'd expect in terms of coordinated activity to you know bind and process that stimulus and so yeah like the the baseline activity was too high and then the impact the stimulus had was lower just suggesting there might be more noise of it beforehand, and then it's just not fully pro properly encoding it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. Um, I guess quickly too, do you want to touch on, so what are the similarities of, you know, the kind of ketamine state and psychosis, and what are the differences, right? Because I don't think this paper is saying ketamine causes psychosis, right? Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. It's actually not making really any claims about subjective experience. It's more like a mechanistic study. And, um, you know, 
I think partially why ketamine as well as in back in the day, hopefully not as much anymore, uh, like serotonergic psychedelics like psilocybin have been characterized through the lens of schizophrenia is just due to a lack of models of these altered kind of states um, in medicine, in psychology, in neuroscience, that we just immediately go to what's familiar, which is pathologizing them as psychotic or schizophrenic. And so, you know, with ketamine, um, ha- going into an experience where, you know, your cognition seems to be less logical or rational and more dreamlike, and you're having kind of visual imagery and um, your ability to concentrate and problem solve in the normal way is kind of perturbed in, a, in certain aspects. And, you know, people might have some fearful, paranoid thoughts depending on um, their preparation for it and et cetera. And so there are some subjective phenomena that seem to be uh, somewhat similar to what might, one might experience in certain phases of a, of a psychosis episode or what have you. Um, but I think, you know, just many differences too. And um, it's hard to make that one-to-one mapping. I think the as we kind of refine our models of ketamine and also schizophrenia and psychosis and uh, deepen our terminology and our ability to differentiate the types of experiences, we'll see how they really are quite different. But I think for now, um, based on the limitations we have in looking at these subjective states in a refined way, um, you know, I think the similarities are highlighted. Um, that said, there are similarities at the level of the brain, which is interesting because both seem to be very much related to glutamate. But the thing with glutamate is like it's involved in basically every disorder because it's the most one of the most important neurotransmitters in the brain related like fundamentally, you know, uh, fundamental to making neurons fire more and interact with each other and uh, and neuroplasticity and all these processes. Um, so there is a lot of, I think, mechanistic overlap that could be informative and useful. But I think the phenomenological specifics can be quite different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I was curious about this too. So I know we don't know a lot about the development of schizophrenia in the brain, but what do we know? Yeah. I mean, it's a very complex area. And for example, I mean, there's been efforts in the past to identify the schizophrenia gene or whatever, and uh, it's much more complex than that. There are many genes which contribute to one's vulnerability to developing schizophrenia, but there's no schizophrenia gene. And, um, and just, you know, the, what we're calling schizophrenia, what we're diagnosing as it um, can be very different in how it manifests and uh, et cetera for a given person and at a given point in time. And so um, given that there's a variety of ways it can emerge, you know, one way is kind of the neurodevelopmental way where genetically you might be pro- predisposed to it, you might be vulnerable to it. And then when you, if you were to have a stress like a very stressful childhood or a certain number of traumatic experiences which change the way your nervous system functions, then you might over time develop it or move in that direction. And then it's just like the manner in which your brain develops is such that those kind of symptoms will appear at some point. Um, Or people just have acute psychotic breaks in times of extreme stress, you know, even if they're not necessarily predisposed to it. And I, I personally know people who've had that and just like, especially with COVID, like, you know, having a lot of stress and a lot of things falling through that they had planned and trouble with their work and then not having to sit at home all day by themselves. Like, um, you know, that can induce, like high level stress can induce it probably through the glutamate system because it is very linked to stress as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, we would call the etiology, like the, the, the ways, um, the contributing factors to it, what gives rise to it, to schizophrenia, can vary widely. Um, but I think it does, there is something to say about the interaction between genetic vulnerability and stress and trauma and the glutamate system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I know you've spent a lot of time on the default mode network. Um, is that related to schizophrenia or, or how are they related? I would guess I would ask. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a difficult question. I mean, uh, the neuroimaging research looking at the DFMO network is often pretty. Um, uh, it's not a, it's it's equivocal. Like, there's no clear answer. There's some studies that will contradict, and some studies will highlight it, and some won't really find it. Um, some studies really emphasize, yeah, you know, somat- like changes to our sensory and motor cortex are central. Then some will say your PFC, and then some will say your D- default mode network. 
Um, and it might be, it's probably all, it's probably, it's not but, it's and, right? And it's like, but it's also very specific to different people and how it manifests for a different person and their, and their, and their symptom presentation and also what gave rise to it. So I say it gets really complex, but I think it's sensible to think that the default mode network is important because it's involved in, uh, fundamentally involved in processes related to our sense of self, to how we perceive um, and kind of like conceptualize our experience of the world and ourself and how we draw on our memory to interpret and, um, and so on and interpret our experiences and the minds and experiences of others. These are obviously all altered. So there has to be some kind of um, dysfunction going on there. And so I think um, just conceptually, it's very um, plausible that a lot of the symptoms, um, especially perhaps, I guess, both positive and negative symptoms are related to the default mode network in some way. But I, I think it's much more complex with that. And I wouldn't be surprised if some you know people who have schizophrenia just don't have that same pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then I have a question about entropy as well. So, so this paper found that ketamine being an NMDA receptor inhibitor increases the brain background noise, which you've touched on, uh, causing higher entropy of incoming sensory signals and disrupting their transmission. So I guess what kind of issues can increased entropy, i.e. unpredictability, cause? Yeah, it's an interesting question because... Um... It depends on the context, I think, and it depends on the brain region. Uh, for, example, for example, in the context of psilocybin and, and things, higher entropy is emphasized a lot as a kind of positive marker of um, the ability to change, you could say, or, or like kind of almost neuroplastic mechanisms of um, being able to overwrite existing patterns and, you know, and experience new things and think in different ways. Um, but, but importantly, that's in relation to kind of spontaneous, like ongoing activity, spontaneous on, ongoing activity, not in relation to a stimulus. So you would probably want when you're processing something for the activity in the relevant regions to be coordinated over time. You want it to be to show that there's some ongoing temporally extended process going on that is coordinated in time. And so here, after they gave the stimulus, after they vibrated the whiskers of these mice, um, they had reduced, I'm sorry, uh, increased entropy in the sensory processing. And how they interpret it is that um, the ability for these neurons to coordinate over extended periods of time to kind of um, consistently encode that stimulus was impaired. And it's a bit more um, fragmented and not as neatly integrated over time. And so therefore it's unpredictable because it's not following a pattern associated with Kind of this uniform processing of the stimulus, and so in the process, in the context, I think of um, sense perception, I think you probably wouldn't want a tons of entropy. You want it to be um, predictable over time, uh, suggesting there's like kind of clean and precise processing of that stimulus. And so, yeah, in this case, that's how they interpret it. It's like increased uh, entropy in the context of processing the stimuli was a bad thing and indicates that uh, a kind of disruption of the ability of the circuits to encode it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on to this next paper. Uh, thank you for that. That was, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I've known a couple of people with schizophrenia, so it's, it's really, yeah, it's cool to see, you know, maybe we can uh, actually figure out what's going on there and, uh, get these people some help. Right. Um, yeah. So the next paper we wanted to chat with you about hasn't been published yet, but we have the preprint. This is titled psilocybin induces acute and persisting alterations in immune status and the stress response in healthy volunteers. This was a study done by Natasha Mason, Natasha Mason, among others, and even Dr. Jan Ramakers assisted. Yeah, again, I'll, uh, I'll open the floor for you. Um, you want to give us a high level summary on this one as well? For sure. I really like this paper and I think there really needs to be more research like this. Um, just like outside of psychedelics in general, there's greater recognition of how um, the immune system and inflammatory markers and these things underlie a lot of mental health disorders and, and not to mention physical disorders. And just kind of emphasizing this, this holistic systems level view of um, mental health disorders that, you know, recognizes that these processes far outside of the brain, like in the body and these peripheral processes are very important. 
And so here, uh, Natasha and colleagues were um, looking at like, how do inflammatory cytokines, which are these uh, like uh, signaling molecules released by uh, the immune system uh, in response to you know injury and infection and and so on as a way of helping um, cells repair and recover uh, and so on and get the nutrients they need. And um, so they're measuring those and how they're changed with um, after psilocybin, after taking psilocybin acutely and after psilocybin, and also how that relates to actually glutamate and then uh, cortisol levels as well. So it's this really cool, yeah, kind of holistic approach to it. And as I kind of mentioned before, um, a lot of evidence suggesting that people who have depression or PTSD or what have you have higher circulating levels of inflammatory cytokines. And among these are um, a class of them called interleukins. Uh, and then interleukin-6 is a very commonly discussed one that is upregulated in people with depression. Um, and something else called CRP. Uh, I can't remember what it stands for right now. Uh, um, uh, something releasing. C-reactive protein. <laughs> C-reactive protein, yeah, which is uh, another inflammatory marker produced by the liver. Um, so they, they measured those two as well as something called tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is something that's released immediately in, in response to like an inflammation-inducing event. And so they found that um, uh, during the psilocybin experience, tumor TNF-A, TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor, alpha was uh, reduced kind of immediately during the experience. And then at one week later, um, TNFA wasn't reduced, but interleukin-6 and CRP were both reduced. And so this suggests there are certain anti-inflammatory mechanisms that happen right during the experience and then that also persist at seven days later. And something that was interesting is that, or like notable, is that the reductions in interleukin-6 and CRP at one week were uh, correlated with greater improvements in positive mood and also kind of pro-social pro behavioral effects, suggesting that, you know, not only is it reducing inflammation as measured in the bloodstream, um, this actually might be related to the long-term persisting positive effects. And that might be a kind of a shock to a lot of people because we emphasize neuroplasticity, we emphasize a missile experience, what about downregulating your immune system? That's pretty interesting, right? That's like a whole other ballgame, whole other world that we can look into here. Uh, and of course, all these things are so tightly coupled, as is everything in the body. Um, so they found that, and they also found that the acute during experience reductions in TNFA uh, was associated with reductions in glutamate in the hippocampus and also with increased cortisol. Um, and so what does that, all that mean? Uh, What's interesting is that acute cortisol release through your HPA axis um, is actually anti-inflammatory in the short term. It reduces inflammation. And so it might be that psilocybin increased cortisol and thereby uh, cortisol reduced TNFA uh, right away because it's anti-inflammatory. And um, that is, that, the fact that this is related to glutamate in the hippocampus is interesting. Uh, reductions in glutamate there um, is interesting. And... Um, the reason being the, the hippocampus is actually very involved in our stress system as well. And actually, it's almost like a thermostat in terms of our uh, HPA axis, so, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which mediates cortisol release and our stress response. And so the hippocampus actually, when there's high levels of cir circulating cortisol, it reduces release in the, um, in the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. It it kind of it acts as a negative feedback mechanism, and so um, what reduced activity in this context means, um, you know, one way of interpreting it is that it has it needs to less regulate the cortisol levels, um, but it's a bit confusing what it means here because cortisol is increased. But in any case, it's it's also suggesting in general that there's this interaction between um, psilocybin's effects on the stress system and and the immune system. And then the central nervous system, like these three things are being all altered here, which is like super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing from the study, which is uh, good to mention, is that they actually um, tested people seven days after psilocybin, um, you know, people who didn't take it, didn't take psilocybin, people who did, and put them through a stressful experience, like a stress induction um, experience, which was like 
I, I forget the details, but something around um, asking them to count backwards in a complex way while being socially pressured to do it well or something in like something that they've found before to induce a stress response. Mm -hmm. And they found that seven days later, people who received psilocybin had reduced cortisol release in response to this stressful experience uh, to people who didn't receive psilocybin. So this suggests a persisting downregulation or desensitization of the stress system, which is really interesting because we know a hallmark of trauma is a sensitized uh, stress, system, uh, stress system, as well as kind of chronic depression, chronic PTSD. Your, your stress uh, system is hypersensitive and unable to regulate itself. Mm -hmm. And so this suggests uh, a kind of increased almost resilience to stress even week a week later which is also really interesting and promising yeah that's fascinating yeah because they're right i think there is something to be said about you know kind of uh physiological spiritual resilience right you know um not that it's easy but this is saying that there is a physical measurable change in resilience which is i mean that's really interesting and yeah and i know you touched on a few other things too right i mean I know that, you know, I know both of us have seen and heard a lot of stories of people, you know, healing from all kinds of mental health issues, you know, chronic pain, depression, anorexia. And we've always known something's going on spiritually, but it's really cool to actually see it on this like physiological level, right? It's making direct measurable changes to the body, which, I mean, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I know you talked about a lot, so I'm just, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, I'm going to read a quote from the paper, and I, I think you touched on it already. Uh, so psilocybin immediately reduced concentration of the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNFA. I'm, I'm curious, what kind of effects will someone have when they have chronically elevated TNFA, you know, more than the healthy amount? Um, you know, it's firing way too much. It's sticking around too long. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, usually TNFA will occur uh, as like an immediate response to an inflammation and then all sorts of other, uh, you know, interleukins and other compounds will also be upregulated. So it usually comes in the context of a whole suite of things. And so when TNFA alongside with these other um, cytokines, et cetera, are elevated in a chronic way, um, that can have a variety of effects. But in terms of the brain, one of the ways it can have an effect is on the glutamate system, as we've talked about. And um, one of the ways that can happen is that... Um, Usually when neurons fire and release glutamate, um, glutamate needs to be cleared from the synapse. So the area between a given two neurons, it needs to be kind of pulled out of that synapse in a timely manner and put back into the neurons. Because if there's a lot of glutamate just sitting out there for a long time, it can induce mechanisms that lead to uh, neuronal atrophy. It can actually kill neurons, make them shrivel up, reduce the number of dendrites. Um, and that happens through so-called extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, actually, um, among other other things. And so chronic stress can actually damage or downregulate these other kinds of cells called glial cells, which are very important in clearing glutamate from the synapse. And so it's basically um, a lot of stress is going to perturb the kind of homeostatic mechanisms that are trying to maintain a good balance of glutamate that's available at any given time. And so when there's chronically high um, inflammation, there's bad clearance of glutamate, and then it starts to spill out all over the place outside of that synapse and hitting these extrasynaptic uh, you know, receptors, and then reducing neuroplasticity, reducing the number of dendrites, making neurons less able to function well. And that's kind of one of the ways it can lead to mental health disorders, because if that's all happening, let's say in your prefrontal cortex, all of a sudden your ability to pay attention is impaired, your ability to... Uh, escape from a negative thought is impaired. Your ability to regulate your emotions is impaired just because your neurons are becoming less like uh, able to function in their proper way. Again, because of too much glutamate and these so-called excitotoxic uh, mechanisms. And so, and so, yeah, so like chronically high uh, inflammation, you know, even rooted in your body, it will eventually get into your brain um, and influence uh, brain function in these kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And, and even on a simple level, right, if, if you have kind of chronic inflammation, uh, one of the things that can happen is that your, your brain almost starts to believe that you are sick or very near to sick, right? And it initiates this kind of shutdown response. Can you, can you touch on that a little more? Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting because if you think about it, 
the immune system is obviously meant to protect us from infections and you know damage to our body essentially and if it believes that you're in a place where you're damaged and it needs to upregulate inflammation it's the body's going to want you to go take a rest and be by yourself and not be hyperactive uh, just to allow more resources to be used towards recovering and so if you have this kind of persistent inflammation all the time your body's going to have less motive like your in general your nervous system is going to have less motivation less of a desire to go out and do things you're just going to want to kind of um, sit in your room and not engage with anybody. You're not going to want to be social. And that sounds a lot about like depression, right? So it's like maybe a lot of the times what we're calling depression is really um, your body's response to feeling like it's infected with something because of inflammation, which can be due to a whole variety of things. It could be due to stress. could be due to eating processed food. That's probably a very popular thing because it's very linked to your gut health, your microbiome. And it could be linked to a whole variety of things which we would never think naturally is can lead us to be depressed but just by the reaction our immune system has yeah can lead us to exhibit those behaviors and even the terrible thing is that can happen maybe you're eating a crappy diet and you start having these kind of tendencies and then you go to a psychiatrist or a doctor and they're like oh you sound like you're depressed here's an antidepressant so instead of just eating a healthier diet or even asking about your diet which they don't a lot of the time they just put you on a drug which is just masking it and going to have its whole set of side effects. You know, it's like, so yeah, that kind of nonsense really, really uh, irks me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, it seems to be a lack of a holistic approach, right? Like, yes, maybe mm -hmm. your serotonin levels are off, but maybe you're eating a junk diet. Maybe you're not working out, right? Maybe your, your sleep is really screwed up. And um, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of factors and we don't really take them all into account. It's, and it's really interesting, too, because there's uh, this kind of new theory of depression where when you're under prolonged or chronic stress, traumatic events, it, you know, it's your, you know, your brain, you know, loves you, wants to protect you. So it kind of initiates this shutdown numbing kind of response to protect you from, you know, the full feelings of whatever is going on or what mm -hmm. your brain perceives to be going on. But it sounds like something similar happens with, you know, chronic inflammation as well, right, where you're your brain is really just trying to protect you. So it initiates all these yeah. different kind of uh, adaptive responses, but then they become maladaptive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think that's a great point. I think, yeah, I mean, the body's never, everything the body's doing is trying to, is in, it's, it perceives it to be in your best interest, right? It wouldn't deliberately harm itself. So it's like, yeah, when these things go awry, when these, yeah, as you say, adaptive and protective mechanisms go awry and are extended way longer than they should be. That's when issues start to arise. But it always comes from a good place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know, so I know you were talking about glutamate as well and kind of the effects of too much glutamate. And, you know, this paper mentions uh, acute reductions in TNFA were linked to lower concentrations of glutamate in the hippocampus. Um, so I have, a, yeah, I have a couple questions here, but first off, like, what kind of specific specific effects does chronically elevated glutamate in the hippocampus have, and you know what happens if we can lower that concentration? Right. I think um, as I mentioned before, uh, the hippocampus's activity is really sensitive to cortisol levels. So there are a lot of uh, glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus, and the reason being when uh, when these uh, receptors are activated in the hippocampus via cortisol. It, it has negative connections to your hypothalamus, which in your hypothalamus controls your endocrine system and your release of hormones such as cortisol. And so it's like higher hippocampal activity in response to stress down regulates cortisol release through the hypothalamus. And so one of the many ways in which the hippocampus can be activated is through that. Um, of course, it's involved in memory encoding and a whole variety of things, spatial navigation and um, in, in activate in a variety of contexts. But in the context of chronically high glutamate, it's usually in response to stress in the hippocampus. And chronically high glutamate um, can also over time, you know, uh, kind of tax the brain's ability and the supportive glial cells ability to clear it, right? And so you get um, this kind of hyper glutamatergic activity that can induce, again, these kind of excitotoxic mechanisms that reduce neuroplasticity, impair circuit function, impair uh, synaptic function, which then reduces, can reduce the hippocampus' ability to regulate cortisol, which then will keep cortisol even higher and then also increase glutamate. And then it's like it's a cycle where 
you know, not only is our set a stress system and glutamate system becoming hyperactive, our, is our ability to regulate it downwards is progressively being disrupted. And so that's what the loop people get stuck in. And that's why, you know, with different, with, for example, with, um, with uh, depressed patients or depressed people, um, they might be hypersensitive to stress, but also be starting to lose their memory in certain respects too, or having impaired uh, memory because they both are happening in the hippocampus and related to glutamate and these other mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it, in a way, you're someone with elevated glutamate in the hippocampus could, so they get triggered, you know, a lot easy to a lot more easy to use a term. And, it, and then it's also much more difficult to move past that trigger to kind of calm your central nervous system back down. Yeah, totally. And then you get more stress and then you get worse ability to regulate it and so on. So it's like a, that's why you need a circuit breaker. You need to get out of it. And that's what I feel like psilocybin and even ketamine psychedelics uh, can be as a little circuit break out of that to boost neuroplasticity and help uh, recalibrate the system. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with psilocybin reducing the concentrations of, of glutamate. Um, yeah, I had a question relating to, to trauma too. So is the hippocampus one of the brain areas activated whenever something extremely frightening or, you know, borderline traumatic happens? Yes, I think so. Uh, because it's very connected to the amygdala. And we know from a lot of research that experiences of intense emotion and high arousal uh, memories are encoded much more deeply. And and that's through this upregulation. You know, one of the ways this happens is through upregulation re of the hippocampus through the amygdala. And so the uh, amygdala, hippocampus, and our whole like emotional, you know, sen like somatosensory uh, system is very interconnected. And so, yeah, in times of extreme stress, there will be uh, responses. At times of extreme stress, like a traumatic event, there will, will be a large effect on hippocampal function for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, like it, you know, elevated glutamate, it could be, you know, something borderline traumatic happens, but maybe, you know, if your glutamate was at healthy levels, it wouldn't have become traumatic. But if, you know, you do have a elevated glutamate, then it kind of is like, it tilts that memory into traumatic, you know, is that is that something that is possible? That could be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's all, yeah, it's hard to disentangle causality. So, so it's like, you know, is it that the brain already has high glutamate or because we're stressed, it's upregulating glutamate. And then that has later effects. It's like, which one comes first? We don't know, but we do know all these things coincide and it's hard to disentangle them. But mm -hmm. what you said could very well be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, anything else you want to touch on really quick before we move on to uh, this next paper, which I know you're very excited to talk about? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think what, what also is very interesting, they didn't look at it here, and I mentioned it briefly, is how um, certain bacterial species in your GI, in your gut, relate to all these things too. Because they're having some studies, um, preliminary studies, looking at your the concentration of um, bacteria in your in your gut, like your basically just composition of your microbiome, and how that is interrelated with inflammatory markers and neurotransmitter levels and all these different things. So I think that's that's the other thing that's in this puzzle here. Like here, it's talking about inflammatory cytokines, cortisol, and glutamate. But then I think the other thing, which is intimately correlated with these things, is your microbiome, and I think that's something that's really interesting. And I'm sure Natasha and others have that in mind in the future. Um, and yeah, so I look forward to seeing that work as well. Just having, having a more comprehensive view of how psilocybin and other, other psychedelics, I'm sure, um, affect our brain and body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to this uh, next paper. Canalization and Plasticity in Psychopathology, led by Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris and a few others and our guest right here, Manesh. So yeah, I'll open the floor. Uh, you want to give us a high level summary? If you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. This is a cool paper. And so like, you know, uh, something that Robin is really good at is synthesizing large literatures and coming up with these theoretical, theoretical frameworks. I know he's, he's always reading widely and trying to synthesize ideas. And this is his latest brainchild basically. And he had invited a whole bunch of co-authors, 
uh, including myself, um, to be a part of it. So yeah, super honored to be on that paper. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, hmm. the paper takes as a starting point the idea that uh, neuroplasticity is kind of a double-edged sword. It's not always positive. It can be negative in, in, in certain contexts. And um, if you think about how the brain works, one of the fundamental principles is that you know neurons that fire together will wire together. So if you're if a particular set of neurons are constantly activating together over time, their ability to activate each other will be increased. And that's kind of standard view of neuroplasticity, right? You're creating circuits through repeated activation. And um, the idea here is in this paper is that a lot of our mental health conditions, this is called them psychopathologies. That's how it's framed in the paper. Uh, you know, most forms of psychopathology um, might happen as a process over time where an initially adaptive uh, behavior, which might have help, helped, you know, relieve negative emotion, relieve stress um, as a form of coping mechanism, like these things that are initially done for a reason of self-preservation or to escape negative feelings, over time as they're activated repeatedly become our go-to response, even in situations that don't call for it. We might not be able to, like, in other words, we might not be able to turn it off and we, we always go to it. And, um, and so he describes this as a process of canalization. And you think of a canal, like a canal is like kind of, um, let's say, trying to really direct water in a very specific way. You're controlling it, you're narrowing it, and you're focusing it. And so um, he's contrasting here this concept of canalization of, again, having tunnel vision, being focused on a particular behavior or perspective or thought pattern. He's contrasting that with something he calls kind of phenotypic complexity or um, your ability to learn or um, or entropy for that matter. And what that basically means is you can think of two extremes in terms of an organism's behavior, human, any animal, whatever. On one extreme, they're very sensitive to your environment. They're able to learn, try out new different ways of responding and viewing it and have a lot of flexibility. And so they'll respond to the adaptive needs of the moment based on what the moment needs. And then the other extreme, it's like, you know, um, you see everything as a nail, you try to hit everything as, with a hammer, you know, I, I'm butchering that, but like, basically like they have a very limited set of behaviors and they just default to them all the time, even if they're not, might not be fully suitable for that context. It's like, oh, it's close enough. I'm just going to do that behavior. I know how to do. It might be a nail. And, and, and that's, sorry. But it might be a nail, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. It might be a nail, so I'm just going to whack it, you know, with my hammer. And um, and so in that state, you're not really learning. You're not paying attention to your environment. You're just getting enough information to engage in this automatic response, which is limited, canalized. And so, again, this whole idea here is that, for example, um, I'll use a specific example, like depression. Let's say initially you um, are having a tough time uh, for whatever reason in your life. And you realize if you think about it, if you spend time thinking about it, you might feel a bit better and you're able to uh, maybe come to a better understanding of it, a new perspective, and uh, feel good about it. So then you're like, oh, like I'm just going to think about and overthink about everything until I feel better. And then over time, you know, a lot of times you just get stuck in loops and you're stressing yourself out and you're prolonging a negative emotion much longer than it needs to be prolonged, you're not getting that relief. But then you can't help it because now you're like, so used to habitually over-processing things and worrying about things because maybe a few times it helped you and now it's like you, this is your default. Mm -hmm. And then that leads you to be stressed and leads you to ruminate more and more Then you're diagnosed with depression, right? And then it's like 10 years later and you're having a tough time. And so that process of going from this behavior which you were choosing voluntarily to an automatic response to everything and that you can't shut off is kind of what he's uh, pointing to here as a situation in which neuroplasticity can go awry and be not in our favor. And um, and as you can, kind of might imagine, another part of this paper is the solution to that, a proposed possible solution to that. And um, in describing that, he refers to this concept called uh, temperature, which he's drawing from, I guess, dynamical systems theory and um, kind of um, understanding of how a system can change uh, and that's very abstract but uh, one way of understanding it is like let's say you have you're like a blacksmith let's say you're, you're in game of thrones or lord of the rings whatever you're a blacksmith 
you you're trying to make this sword and in order to you and say you get a bunch of steel ore or whatever and in order to make the sword in the shape that you want it to be you have to like liquefy it you have to really really heat it up so you can mold and shape it in the way you want to and put it into a cast or mold or whatever and have it actually form into something else and so you can say that the metal um, is more flexible and malleable when it's heated up, right? And then let's say it wasn't very sharp, it was in a weird shape, and you heat it up and then refine the shape and let it cool down, now it's a better sword. And so the idea here is that when we're canalized into a certain behavior, the sword is in a bad sh is in bad shape. It's in it's kind of like um, maybe a lot thinner than it needs to be, or it's a bit bent, it's not ideal. And then so in order to change it, you're going to have to reduce its rigidity temporarily. You have to heat the temperature. And so what he's saying, psychedelics like psilocybin, uh, increase the temperature of our internal models of the world, um, of our canalized behavioral tendencies, heats them up to make them more malleable and flexible temporarily. So then we can maybe change them. And then afterwards, when they cool down, try to keep those insights, you know, through, in this context, integration practices, et cetera, um, to have that sword then be in a better shape, which corresponds to uh, us having better adaptive patterns to deal with our life. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, pat that concept of temperature goes hand in hand with boosted uh, metaplasticity, as he calls it in the paper, but we don't need to go to that level of detail, but plasticity um, and also entropy and ability to escape other patterns. And so, yeah, so basically that's his theory of psychopathology he's proposing and, and that gives rise to a framework of how psych why psychedelics and other plasticity boosting drugs and so on and practices uh, might be useful for escaping that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I, I could go in a few directions there. Um... That's fascinating. So, yeah, you know, I, just to go back even a little further, but I, you know, I never really heard of overthinking as uh, described in a maladaptive kind of coping way, but it, it makes total sense, right? It's like, yeah, there were times, uh, maybe even especially as a child, you you did need to overthink. You really had to like, you know, think something through. Um, but that is something that is probably only useful sometimes, right? It's like you start overthinking. Mm -hmm. You know, am I getting a Snickers or M and M's? That's that's it's gonna make life a little <laughs> yeah, hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and it, and it makes me think of so many kind of different pathologies that you know we all deal with, or right, like you know, addiction, right? It could be described in this framework. Mm -hmm. um, anorexia mm -hmm. could be described in this framework. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's totally. That's interesting. Um, yeah, okay. I guess I'm curious. So is the temp-mediated plasticity, or or I believe it's temperature ent entropy-mediated plasticity, that's the one mm -hmm. that, you know, most people tend to experience whenever they uh, take a psychedelic. And that's the mm -hmm. kind of the opposite of this canaliz canalization, which is more of our sober state, normal waking consciousness kind of learning. Yeah, yeah, you can say like the the normal state of consciousness type of learning is more protracted. It's more extended over time, and this happens uh, a lot of the times involuntarily, but it can happen voluntarily, and it can happen for a positive in a positive way that for that matter, right? It's like we're talking about it in terms of a negative of, of a pattern that becomes maladaptive. But let's say you use those same mechanisms for I don't know having a really good meditation practice or for creating good habits and tendencies in your life, you know, mentally and in terms of your behavior. And just by repeating those over time in the same way, those will become your go-to uh, responses. Uh, it doesn't have to be negative. It's just like when people are diagnosed with things, it's usually because something's gone in the negative direction. Um, and you need to replace that with a positive one. Mm -hmm. And so it can go either way. Whereas, yeah, the temp mediator that's talked about in this paper is more like, um, like an acute, shorter experiences, experience, which really boosts your neuroplasticity and allows you to escape old patterns and kind of reset and recalibrate the system. And is this related to the Rebus model where, you know, because it, it sounds like the right, I know with the Rebus model, the, the liberation of bottom-up sensory input kind of can lead lead to this state where maybe people can make changes. Is, is this uh, related to that? This temp Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, this paper goes hand in hand. In some sense, it's like a, 
it's like another piece of that puzzle. It's an expansion of that whole framework, which is in the entropic brain. He proposed the rebus model, the concept of pivotal mental states, and now there's canalization. Those are all his integrated, like Robin's integrated view he's been proposing, and they all uh, complement each other. So yeah, so the temp media um, plasticity is basically the same idea as our high level models and priors becoming less influential. Now we're open to bottom up inputs as we kind of refine the sword, as I was saying before, as we take in more information to refine that in a more ideal or a healthy uh, way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, something I've noticed too, and I'm sure you've noticed this as well is just, I've heard a lot of stories of people who are able to find some healing with psychedelics, uh, you know, during the day of the dose, the trip, the experience, whatever you want to call it. But then, you know, maybe two weeks, three weeks, four weeks later, whatever issue they were able to make progress on kind of, you know, they kind of fall right back into it. Um, you know, that could be chronic pain, that could be addiction, you know, cigarette smoking, whatever. Um, but yeah, is that, so is that kind of, um, is that, you know, almost a failure, not a failure, I guess, just a I guess the goal would be to create a new canal, right? That is healthier and away from that, uh, you know, previous maladaptive behavior. Is that, and is yeah, that, yeah. you know, what are some of the issues, I guess, there um, that can lead to that? Yeah, totally. I mean, the brain is really hard to change, right? You might have this intense experience, but those other circuits are ready there to click back online and restore their connections once you start doing that behavior again. So for me, in my head, what it comes down to is like the, the, the space in between a stimulus and the response, right? It's like that, that thing that usually triggers you to engage in that negative behavior, it might be, you know, um, somebody saying something to you that upsets you, or it might be being stressed, or it might be um, looking yourself in the mirror or whatever. There's something that triggers you to engage in a particular pattern. And then when you have a psychedelic, maybe that connection is a bit less strong for a little while after, but there's still going to be that little impulse to just do that behavior because you're so used to it. And so I think, yeah, in order to encode new circuits, which now when you experience that stimulus, instead of going to that old behavior, you go to a new one, you're going to have to very consciously um, do that replacement behavior on a very consistent basis. That's why, you know, consistent concrete actions in your integration process are so important because mm -hmm. you want to cut that, cut that cord so uh, off as much as you can. And so, yeah, I, as we know, psychedelics give you an opportunity. They don't do it for you. You got to do that hard work afterwards. Otherwise, the brain just wants to come back into its, prat into its old patterns. Yeah. So it sounds like those, those neural pathways are still there. And it, is, that why, is that why, you know, one, even one or two little mess ups, like, well, I'll just have one cigarette. Is, is that why it's so easy, even just from one or two cigarettes, to fall right back in? It's because those pathways are just waiting waiting for you to do that and they're they're just like oh we're back you know yeah i think something like that yeah because you're primed to it because it was such a pattern before and you can think of how this is adaptive let's say you learned a positive skill you know and you fell off for a bit you'd, you'd hope it's easier to get back into it than if you just started from scratch right mm -hmm. like you, that's just kind of what you'd hope the brain does and it does do that because presumably it evolved to do that but it is the double edge of that if you learned a bad behavior it, the brain itself doesn't know what's good or bad. It just knows it's a behavior that you've done many times. Yeah. And so it's going to make it easier to relearn it because it might be adaptive. But if it's not, it just makes it difficult to let go of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you went, you know, if you went on vacation or something, it didn't drive for a few months. It, it would make sense, right, that you are able to just get back in your car and drive, right? It's not like you have to relearn this whole process and all the traffic laws again. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or riding a bike or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, so, um, I'm curious too about kind of the different stages of, uh, you know, encoding events, uh, memories, experiences, right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? You know, the, the early stage where it's, you know, it's mainly in the prefrontal cortex and everything's very ambiguous and malleable but as time goes on this behavior, you know, becomes mm -hmm. canalized, right? It, it becomes very, uh, becomes almost like ones and right. zeros as it goes to the back of the brain. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, how it's how this is talked about in kind of the neuroscience and psychology of learning 
is this process from when we have to really concentrate and focus and kind of use our executive prefrontal processes to really effortfully learn something um, to then when it gets encoded in, in our memory in a way that's automatic, right? And there's a distinction, um, uh, oh, what's his first name? But last name is Kahneman. He won the uh, Nobel Prize, et cetera. And he, his, his, whole, his whole thing of thinking fast, thinking slow. And so his model is these two different types of thinking, right? System one, I believe, is um, the kind of, uh, I might, getting, might be getting the two systems mixed up, but one of them is um, automatically processing something because you have internalized expertise or ability to see the pattern and just respond without consciously thinking about it. And then I think system of two is when you have to stop, pause, and consciously uh, manipulate information and come to the understanding. And so often when you're learning a new task, you're trying to engage a new behavior, you have to use system two. You have to really think it through, pay attention to every step, and it takes a lot of uh, focus to do it. And then later on, it's kind of encoded in your brain in terms of your procedural memory, um, and just, you're able to just automatically engage into it um, without having to think about it. It's like driving. It could be drive to work. You forget you drove. Um, you don't even know the whole process of driving. Whereas the first couple of times you're very at, at the steering wheel, make, making very close attention, not uh, you know being very careful not to crash or do whatever. Um, same with learning an instrument. You might spend weeks and weeks playing a new piece on your guitar, paying attention to every note and trying to learn it. And then after a couple like months or whatever of practicing it, you could just play the whole thing barely even paying attention. And so that's kind of process. And yeah, and that relates to all sorts of good or bad behaviors we can do in our life and kind of relates to this canalization too. It's like initially you were conscious you were doing that and you were even consciously choosing to do it. But then later it's not a conscious choice anymore. That behavior is running you. And that's when it's become canalized automatic uh, through these plasticity mechanisms. Yeah. Wow. So that, I mean, yeah, that, and that can relate to so many things. You know, I, I makes me think of a story. Um, you know, I, spoke with a person a couple years ago and I'm not going to say who they are, but they, um, they were someone who were suffering from severe treatment resistant PTSD. They had a healing experience with a psychedelic medicine. And, uh, you know, maybe six months after that experience, they witnessed something extremely traumatic, uh, out in public, something very scary. Um, and, you know, they told me one of the biggest things they did in that moment was they, and they were very lucky there that this person's therapist was available, but they immediately had a two hour psychotherapy session with their therapist. And he, this person reported that basically, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, this person reported that basically that experience did not become traumatic, right? It was like, so now, you know, uh, I think so. I think there's something to be said about early intervention, right? That early stage of, of processing, right? If you can get to it before it makes its way back to, to the back of the brain. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. I'm, I'm really excited to see where this, yeah, where this research goes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think what you're pointing to is this, you know, cat catching the canalization process early in a sense, right? It's like, I do think if somebody has a very intense emotional experience, uh, the faster you process that, the better, because the longer it stays in your nervous system um, and in your mind, it's going to be influencing behaviors, which then you engage in over multiple days and then just makes it harder to escape from, right? So it's like if you can feel what you need to feel and process what you need to process as soon as you can, um, that's much better. And the lasting imprint it's going to have on you is going to be shorter. Mm -hmm. And it, go, yeah, it goes hand in hand with this paper and what it's proposing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm conscious of time. Is, um, is there anything you want to, you know, add or anything else you want to talk about, whether this paper or anything else on your mind? Hmm. Yeah, that's something that comes to mind uh, broadly is kind of, I guess, what you're speaking to. And, and this actually mentioned, Robin mentions it in this paper, too, is the, and actually, I'm reading Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of the Normal, right now, and he talks about it, too is actually interesting overlap between some of the stuff he proposes and what Robin does. Maybe Robin read his book as well. But in any case, it's this view of mental illness as a process rather than a discrete thing. Because we kind of like will say, you know, oh, you have depression or you have uh, PTSD or you have this. It's like you have a noun. It's like a thing that you have. 
not a process you're experiencing or moving through. You know, it's more like a verb. It's something you're doing. Um, and it's something that's dynamic and that changes over time. And, you know, and of course, many stories of people who receive 10 different diagnoses over a couple of year period, or even in like a couple of weeks, go to three different psychiatrists, get three different disorders, uh, the diagnoses. And it speaks to this idea that, you know, the nervous system in general is this dynamic, ever-changing process. And we can enter into states and transient periods, which are, you know, reminiscent of certain disorders, but that doesn't mean you have that disorder. It means you're just manifesting in that given moment in that particular way. And so I think I really enjoy more of a process view of mental health conditions. And I think that will inform um, different approaches to treatment, like things that really emphasize early intervention and noticing the stage of um, where you're at in relation to a disorder even uh, potentially moving beyond the concept of a discrete disorder into different system clusters and how they change over time without having labeled them. Um, but, um, but I remember as we had talked about previously, um, people benefit from a story. People want an interpretation for their experiences. And so it's like how to shift people into a framework and a way to interpret their experience, which doesn't, limit them because a lot of the times saying somebody has something means like you are a person who has ADHD, you are a person with depression and that person's identification with that label can then be an impediment to actually getting better. Cause that's, they're like, Oh, that's who I am. So I think if we provide compelling inter interpretational frameworks for mental health conditions that don't posit that you are something, but that you're just manifesting a dynamic process that could be, um, potentially uh, lead to better prognoses for people and allow them to not get stuck in their disorders as strongly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think that's very interesting. And I think I, I really uh, enjoy that view and hope research moves in that direction and uh, would enjoy seeing psychedelics and their impact as well through this kind of extended, temporally extended dynamic lens of mental illness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. It's like, yeah, because, you know, some doctors will, will tell their patients, you have major depression. And it's just kind of, I could see that being frightening in a way, right? It's like, man, you know, how long is it going to take to, you know, get out of this? This is, this is serious, right? And it's like, maybe don't use that like you have this, like you were saying, you don't, you know, you don't have this. You're, you're going through a process right now. Um, you know, let's get to the bottom of it. And there, there's probably a lot of causes, right? Um, yeah, I really appreciate that, that perspective. And I tend to mostly agree with you on that, if not fully. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Manesh. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please uh, go check out our website, psychedelicstoday.com, for information about vital convergence. Uh, we just launched a microdosing masterclass course uh, taught by Jim Fadiman, Adam Brandledge. And yeah, um, thank you all very much. And we'll see you next week. Bye.